Hey guys, welcome back to Unstoppables. In this quest to get to the future fast, I have an incredible, incredible guest today. It's my privilege of having Amy Renee Havalka. Hey Amy, how are you? Very well, thank you for having me. Well, it's good, it's good. I, um, I, I love the idea that you were hired to help people to save money in a way they bought things, the way they were purchasing. And you're telling me some amazing numbers, like when you were 24 years of age, you got hired by the New South Wales government, the police, from memory, and you helped them to save millions. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. Actually, when I was uh, 24, I got put on a special project, which was strategic sourcing, which is buying things smarter, mm -hmm. differently. And we were trying to um, put together a methodology for the first time on how to save money. And we, the objective was $3 million for New South Wales Police. And in the end, we actually delivered $12.4 million. So let me see if I got this right. At the age of 24, you called in on to develop processes to look at the buying chain and see if you could improve the mechanisms to save some money along the way. And your results was $12 million plus. Correct. Is that right? <laughs> That's correct. Oh, and wow. it, it was across various strategies. So one of them was, what if you shifted the ownership of um, the vehicles, the highway patrol vehicles, from uh, two years out to three years and from 40,000 kilometres to 60,000 kilometres? So put together a very detailed strategy to quantify that. Wow. It's amazing, isn't it? When uh, when some, some stuff happens, it's so obvious. And then the third parties brought it on to, um, to actually look into it and say, can we do this better? Now, how did it go for you being so young at the time with such tasks? Was there some, did you face some perhaps some jealousy, some people saying like, what do you know? Did you, did you face some of that? One of my favorite was actually young upstart. What would you know? Uh, you haven't got years and years of experience. And I actually faced that like up until I was 30. I couldn't wait to be 30 to be like a respectable age. Is that so, right? Like, I actually know something. <laughs> and, and at the age of 24, you're already in the process of saving millions, but just investigating off how things are done. See, one of the messages of the unstoppable is to actually question this conversation this is how it's done here stay with it mm -hmm. but you come from a completely different angle isn't it like if this is how, if this is how it's done is there a better way for us to do it I actually grew up in my parents' manufacturing business. So I grew up in an entrepreneurial family. Uh -huh. So it was always in my blood to question things and look at how you can do it better. So I was in, in all my jobs an entrepreneur, looking at ways you could you could do things differently and better. Oh wow. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, some other other clients you had? So after that one, I, I did a project for defense. They were not interested in, in calculating the savings. But the one that was really exciting was working with Caltex. Uh -huh. And once again, I was on a project to save money. And it yes. was to save money so that they could justify the other projects they were working on. And we had a target of $30 million. Oh, wow. And, and then what happened? So they came to me and they're like, how are you going with that, that $30 million? Have you got a finger in the air estimate? I don't do finger in the air estimates. It's going to be very detailed um, analysis of the spend broken down into indicative strategies. So I got the team to work with me really hard over two weeks, keeping them back till midnight sometimes, and we saved a hundred million over three years. Hundred million dollars. A hundred million dollars. Wow. So so let me see if I get this right. So you arrive at an organization. There's a, a, a bunch of things already happening. The ways in in which they execute orders, purchase stuff. The the, the time of listing, how long things do last on a shelf, and etc. So you took a step-back approach, you have a look at the whole entire operation, then you dive into the details, looking for all the inefficiencies, mm -hmm. and then as you clear the, all the inefficiencies, you manage to save Caltex $100 million across, across two years. So it was the plan. I didn't actually finish saving it for them because... Oh, I see. It was, what, this, it was the result of the strategy itself. It was the result of the strategy. I okay. wanted to stay around and save it for them, but uh, the global financial crisis hit. Right. 
And the light at the end of the tunnel was I got headhunted to be the founding member, one of the founding members of King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. Oh, wow. So it's, it's quite interesting to me as, as you start to talk about uh, your journey, how you go from the police force to high-end customers, saving hundreds of millions of dollars, and then suddenly a whole entire government is interested in hiring you to launch their, their university program. Can you take us through a little bit of that experience? And by the way, how old are you when that happened? I was 29 when that happened. Yes. I'm sitting at work on a Friday in a floral dress because I like floral Fridays. And I get the call from my agent and she said, oh, you were thinking of moving. And I'm like, yeah, from Kirribilli to Annandale. She's like, what about um, Saudi? And I'm like, Arabia? Are you sure? What have I done <laughs> to like, be sent to Saudi Arabia? I'm like, I'm the most feminine person I know. You're going to send me where? So I, I, I got on a plane. I went for the interview for three days, and I was bought in by the king's vision to build new industry so that they weren't relying on the oil industry in a couple of years' time. Wow. So I hear in that communication a, a real need to get to the future, right? So let's build a university that will look into research, develop strategies, and implement them so we're not oil dependent and it's from an oil rich country. And they were really trying to build the future. Uh, it was headhunting the professors from all over the world, the best in their breed, to the university. Wow. And you got to play in that field. I got to play in that field. And one of my proudest moments was mm -hmm. actually renegotiating the $1 billion supply chain contract for laboratory consumables and supplies. Oh, wow. Little did they know, did they? Like, he's, he's a person perceived having a lot of money, and money's not an issue. And suddenly they have a strategic person that helps them how to buy right. And there you are, like at your element in a foreign country. And, and being a woman there, how did that, how did that go? Yeah, I actually was a woman um, there and, and still am. And it is a challenge. Um, Saudi Arabia is one of the strictest countries in the world. Um, it is the university was the first university, first organization to have co-education and a co-working environment, men right? and women working together. So wow. being part of that change was an interesting dynamic. And not everybody was aligned with the King's vision. Wow. So I, I, hear, I hear not only you are getting to the future in so many ways, like in helping these people from being oil dependent into other technology dependent, and yet socially... There is things that we take here for granted that we work, men and women, you know, study together. And in other countries in the world, they're still so behind as far as that's concerned, you know. And, mm -hmm. uh, and again, you know, it's so, so, so you're exposed to so much at uh, such an, uh, an early age. But let what all of this, all this experience. So then while you're at the university, you got really uh, in touch with innovation, right? And, uh, and you were telling me that that really brought to you to your attention how sometimes uh, trying to save them trying to save the money and do things super accurate can actually kill innovation. Can you talk to me a little bit about about that? I I got first hand experience in that, and you know sometimes things happen that initially seem negative but turn out to be the best positive in your yes. life. The one that happened to me was when my third boss came along in while well, I was in the, the buying area, and he did not want a female manager on his team. So I so just the fact that you were a woman was an issue. It was a very large issue. All right, got it. And my age, but yes, 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 a woman yes, yes, and yes. young. And I moved across. I had the opportunity to move across to actually be fully aligned with mm -hmm. the vision of the Hing, which was working in the technology transfer and innovation area, working directly with the inventors, um, managing the intellectual property of their inventions, oh, removing obstacles to move these inventions forward. Oh, wow. So so the game then was you were at the university helping them to buy, renegotiate, and suddenly you are here with the innovators in a completely, like, aligned with the vision. And what did you see? What did you see when you all these people coming up with new ideas and the whole issue of commercializing those ideas, bringing them to fruition, to the marketplace, making them tangible and real. What did you learn? 
I, I learned a lot about the commercialization process and the barriers to entry for mm -hmm. commercializing technology. Uh, the need to align it to the strategy of the organization. So rather than taking something and thinking that you know how you want it to be used, but then educating the market at the same time. We had an objective of economic development. So we weren't just taking inventions and commercializing to anywhere in the world just because they had money. Mm. We were trying to build the industry. Oh, and wow. so that education process. And it, it linked with Oof. what I was doing before with buying. So in essence, they were buying this um, innovation into their organization. They were investing in it to bring it in. Wow, wow. And, and my goodness, this is so good. It's funny how the path of an individual, you know, from, from, from your journey to then be... To, what I can see in my mind right now, I'm talking about the path, is how you, you must sit now looking at, as you call it, the barrier of entry... Right from innovation itself to commercialization to education and all these pieces playing together. Even even right now, as I'm I'm trying to pull this out of our conversation here, I'm I'm starting seeing the pieces moving. We are there for you now. Tell me tell me about from all that learning. What do you do now? Because you're telling me this all this learning experience brought you to what you're doing now. So let's unpack a bit of that. It, it did. And you know what? I studied manufacturing management as my undergraduate. Okay. Because I was passionate about not letting the manufacturing industry in Australia go by the wayside. I didn't know that I needed to go to Saudi Arabia to learn how to do that, but that's what I've brought back with me. And it's given me a, a view of how to move innovation forward with having this dynamic of a background in, in buying, bringing in technology, and advancing technology. So with that, there's actually three pillars of analysis that I've gone through. Mm -hmm. One is I can be out there saving companies millions of dollars. I've done it before. I'm good at it. But it, it's not what is going to move innovation forward. It's actually going to prohibit it. So you, once I understand. You I understand. I understand. Yeah. So what are you saying? The very fact that you're trying to analyze to drive the, the cost downs and buying better, buying better... This very process is prohibits, perhaps, creates other gates for the innovation to come in. Absolutely. And, it, and the buying process itself, I know why it's as structured as it is. I did it 10 years ago, but it's time to move on from that. So then my thought was, how do we move on from that? How do we build innovation into that process? If, if everyone is doing innovation for their customers... Shouldn't we value being a customer of innovation hmm. to drive it forward? Wow. Yeah. You see, yes. It's a conversation you and I are having. Everybody likes the idea of innovation. Everybody would like the, the, to benefit from innovation. But how do we bring it? How do we actually implement it, right? So uh, I guess it will be very tough to actually have a process to measure innovation and what innovation is and, mm -hmm. and you know and how so here you are trying to save money which is more and more analytical innovation is trying to knock on the door and say let me in let me in sorry you don't pass my criteria you can't come in you know and then innovation would would arrive and immediately be quantified and go bang off you go the innovation itself changed the game improved uh, the bottom line but the very fact that we do the things we do how we do them prohibits innovation to come in, everybody wants it, but the door is shut. How do you identify, capture, and measure innovation? How do you do that? The, the way that you identify, capture, and measure innovation is really important because the, the interesting part is shifting that, that paradigm that is in the buying organizations of barriers to entry because they're only valuing their contribution to the business on what they save. If they value their contribution on what technology they bring in, then if you identify, um, capture and measure innovation, they will be measured by it as well. I've developed a methodology. All right. I have. Tell me. And it's based on... Um, oh, this is getting really exciting. <laughs> it really is. Because I sit here as an entrepreneur, I, I want to hear it. Because people pitch technology to me, pitch innovation to me all the time. 
and send me a shop and says, Jules, I, I can show you how to measure it. I can actually have an innovation platform. I can tell you begin, middle, man. That's very exciting. So, so if someone comes to you with an innovation now, mm -hmm. how do you how do you quantify how good that innovation is? It's difficult. It's nebulous, right? <laughs> it's like myself. I'm innovative, and that's it. Yes. <laughs> so what I've got is eleven types of innovation. I know that sounds like a lot, but mm -hmm. the more, the better it is to actually. Oh, so you have eleven criteria. 11, criteria, 11 outcomes of innovation. Oh, wow. So you measure against those 11. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And so the more it ticks? The hotter the idea. Got it. They're in a flame. They're in a flame model. The 11 are the different um, spheres of the flame. How wonderful. Right. The hotter the idea. Like, it's going to catch like wildfire. That's it. I get it. I get it. Oh, wow. So talk, take me through it. Take me through it. It's so... So this comes to the second approach, right? So if you if you can actually quantify um, how innovative an idea is, then you can communicate it. So what the next challenge, I've got that, right? So methodology, brilliant. I can go and consult with large organizations and b build this into their businesses. But the next challenge is where do they find the innovation? Wow. So here you are working with uh, large organizations who are looking for innovation. And I'm guessing, just from what you're listen to, to listening to, that here are the small companies with the innovation going, how do we get in? Absolutely. Yes. Because the small companies are the ones who, who are able to move innovation forward fast. Yes. So they may have worked in a large organization, went, this is not working. I'm going to go start my own company, have this brilliant idea that's solving a problem. But how do you get back into the organization? Wow. How do you? Well, so at the moment, if you're building your strategy for five, ten years on, on your product or, or where your business is going, you look on the Internet. You might go to a conference of what's happening in innovation, but that's it. That's all your options are right now. So your strategy is built on today technology, now technology. So when that innovation comes along, and I've heard this several times, it's like, that's great, that's better than what we've got, but it's misaligned with our strategy, so we can't move forward with it. Wow. So the platform, and this is wow. what I'm really excited about. So my first company is called Flamethrower Consulting. It's throwing that flame methodology in there. It's like, okay, you are now going to use this fire methodology. How hot is your innovation? The platform to connect the ideator, the innovator, with the person who can adopt the technology is called Innovation Firebug, deliberately lighting innovation fires and igniting their passion in the sun. Got it. Hey guys, as you're watching this, and we may be going back, backwards for to give you background, to give you this, but here's the crunch of this interview. Here's the crunch. Lots of people have innovation, but they don't know how to place it into the lap of the customers that need them. Sometimes innovation is coming, but the customer have other, other strategies or other visions for their future, for their strategy, and how do we put together? Often, and is telling me that she has worked with uh, large organizations, and she's telling you her background, that actually need uh, the, the innovations, but don't know how to go get it, don't know how to bring it, right? And then, here's the guy, so it's matching. And what you call your second company? Innovation Firebug. Hmm. It is just so, so good. The, the whole concept of actually putting those two together. And we know, as entrepreneurs ourselves, that I am looking for innovation. How do I adapt that innovation into my future? And that's what you basically became a specialist at. Is that right? I'm trying to scale what I do naturally. Right. So I know that one of the professors in KAUST, the King's University, developed a technology to print circuit boards on paper. Right. Print circuit boards on paper. So it's paper workable. printed, good to go. Fully, yeah, good to go. They can be down to this size. So now you have disposable um, circuit technology, sensor technology. What could that actually open up in terms of the Internet of Everything, wearable technology? Whose hands do we want to get that technology in? And if, if that's in Saudi Arabia. So if you're in Australia and you want this technology, how would you How do you get it? it? Yeah. So this is what I'm trying to solve with the platform. 
Oh, wow. What it does is it actually it's using my old buying language of categories, how to break things down into categories, so that you have a value chain of innovation. Wow. What you have is a bridge between old thinking, because mm -hmm. old thinking is let's measure, let's do this, da da da. Innovation is nebulous. It's all over the place. It's forming. So I got it. So you have a bridge between, let me measure it, compartmentalize, and compartmentalize. Blah, blah, blah. How do you say that? Compartmentalize. Compartmentalize. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can't say even still. You guys know what I mean, right? So you're trying to put it, you're trying to put a format around it and say to someone, I understand uh, the, the your difficulties here, but I also equally understand your difficulties here. And the guys that are trying to measure everything, they're killing innovation without knowing. So you actually can shift it around and say, because you measure everything, let me give you a, a bridge that gets you measured and get you into innovation. Absolutely. Mm. And once you've got that, how do you communicate an innovative idea without revealing the intellectual property? Hmm. You do it by, you've got the value chain. Yes. You know where it fits in. Then you have the 11 types of innovation and you know what category of innovation it has. Is it product innovation? Is it service? Is it sustainability innovation, value chain innovation? brand, channel, I won't go into all the 11, but that's the idea. So then you, you know what types of innovation you're looking for in your strategy. Now you can communicate innovation that's in proof of concept stage. Wow. That's just the concept. Put it up there and say, look, this is the idea I have and this is how it's innovative. You can start engaging on co-development with your adopters, with the industry, um, much earlier in the process. And, and with that engagement, strengthen the innovation. So, Amy, if I, if I want to get hold of you, if I have a piece of technology that I want to measure, is that, does it match my future? Does it match what I want? Or if I am looking for innovation, I don't even know how to go get it. And I'm watching this interview and I really am interested in, in finding you. How do I go about it? So, my first company is called Flamethrower. And you can find me at www.flamethrower, one word, .com .au. Mm -hmm. And Innovation Firebug is innovation-firebug.com. Fantastic. Fantastic. Amy, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. It's just like, um, guys, I'd like to summarize this for you. If we were to travel in time only 15 years ago to find somebody who could sit literally between the future and the present, you'd be very unique, very difficult to find such a person. Amy's here right now with a scalable prototype to just bring that to you. So if you're watching this interview right now and you're looking for innovation, look for Amy. If you're watching this video right now and you have a piece of innovations right now in your company at your doorstep and you actually don't know what to do with it, once again, have it quantified, have it measured, and Amy is a specialist in doing just that. My name is Julio Delafitte, and we are Unstoppables. Thank you very much. Thank you.